Hello and welcome. My name is Jacob and I will be your host for today's webinar on T cells and COVID-19 research. Joining me from Sweden are my co-hosts Jens and Laura. Hello, hello, hello. Hello. Thank you guys. And then our presenter for today is Bartek, who's the head of R&D here at MapTech. Also joining us in the expert panel is Marcus Buger, Associate Professor at the Swedish Kalinska Institute, who has published several high impact papers on T cells in the context of COVID-19. Now, before we get started, here's the format for today's webinar. Bartek will give his presentation, followed by a Q&A session. Please post your questions in the Q&A window whenever during the webinar. The Q&A window can be found in the menu in the bottom of your Zoom window. All right, Bartek, take it away. Thank you. So welcome everyone to this seminar on T-cells and COVID-19 research. I'll uh, start off with some methodology before we dive into COVID-19 related data. So this is just a slide comparing three antibody-based methods for T-cell analysis, three very popular methods. So starting on the left, ELISA. Uh, so in this method, you stimulate cells, you take the supernatant and you measure the total amount of released cytokine, for example. You can also measure it in plasma or serum. It's a functional analysis. And there are certain ELISA-like applications which can be multiplexed, such as Luminex, but ELISA, the basic ELISA is not multiplexed. It's kinetics dependent, meaning that T cells releasing cytokines, those cytokines can be used by other cells, eaten up or degraded. So depending on when you take your sample, uh, ELISA is gonna give you a snapshot of the total amount of, for example, interferon gamma at that moment. It's low sensitivity for uh, looking at individual T cells. It's high throughput and it's cheap although the Luminex or other multiplex platforms are quite expensive. Elispot and Fluorospot then, it's a function analysis on a single cell level. So we look at each cell which secretes a cytokine such as interferon gamma. It's multiplexed in the Fluorospot application up to four cytokines can be analyzed. So you can look at polyfunctional T cells producing one, two, three or four cytokines simultaneously. It's kinetics independent. So we capture all the cytokine released during the time of the assay. It's high sensitivity, high throughput, and it's affordable. Flow cytometry then, it's a very powerful method for phenotyping of uh, T cells and other immune cells. So you can divide them into populations based on their surface markers. And Marcus Bugget who's with us in, a, in the panel is really an expert in this method. So we'll come back to this discussion of these two methods uh, in the discussion after the talk. But I would say that flow spot and flow cytometry are really complementary orthogonal methods, which together are extremely powerful to look in depth at T cell function and phenotype. So flow cytometry gives you you can use it to look at cytokine release, but then you need to use cytokine release blockers to actually look at intracellular cytokine accumulation rather than cytokine secretion. It's uh, highly multiplex. It's kinetics dependent. I, I'll come back to that in the next slide. It's uh, medium sensitivity compared to first spot, medium throughput and quite expensive. And you need to fix and permeabilize uh, the cells. So you need to stop the assay basically at a certain point. So this slide's actually showing, so it shows data from a flow cytometry experiment published on CMV. So cytomegalovirus is a human herpes virus and most of us in the population have quite strong T cell responses to this virus. So here they basically look at a CD8 specific response to cytomegalovirus and interferon gamma accumulation in the cells. So they use flow cytometry, they stop cytokine release by Brefeldin A, stopping Golgi export after one, two, three, four, up to 24 hours. 
just to see exactly where the intron gamma peak is. And we can see that the peak is between, let's say, two and six hours. So intron gamma is released quite swiftly upon stimulation. So if we use Ellis spot or floor spot, we will capture all the intron gamma, so all the area under the curve here. While on the right, if we use flow cytometry, and let's say that we stop with Brefeldin A after 10 hours, we will miss the peak. So this is problem, especially looking at several cytokines simultaneously in flow cytometry, which is possible. But then the kinetics of each cytokine has to be studied and you have to find some kind of middle way when to stop to capture the maximum amount of each cytokine. You can also combine flow cytometry and floor spot. This very interesting paper uses first flow cytometry to gate on CD3, CD4 positive T cells, and then to other cell surface markers and using single cell sorting into floor spot plates. And then they sort a single T cell into the plate and in floor spot, they can see that this T cell secretes IL-8 which they were interested in in this case, and not interferon gamma. So they wanted single islet secreting T cells. These T cells were then transferred to a 96 cell culture plate and, and used for T cell cloning. So this is an exciting application where we again see that these methods are very powerful together. So this is a basic cartoon showing how Elispot works. You have a PVDF plate, 96 volt plate, which is, has high protein binding capacity, much, much higher than uh, a regular ELISA plate. So we coat this plate with a monoclonal antibody. <clears throat> this antibody then will capture a cytokine. So it's specific for, let's say, interferon gamma. We add PBMCs, peripheral blood mononuclear cells containing T cells, B cells, antigen presenting cells. These cells upon stimulation will secrete interferon gamma, which is captured. Then we take away the cells and the supernatant, and those can be used in downstream applications such as ELISA and flow cytometry. So after washing, we add the second antibody against the second epitope. And this antibody in this case is biotinylated. So then we add a streptavidin enzyme complex to develop this with a precipitating substrate. This gives spots. So each spot is an individual cell that has secreted interferon gamma. Then we need specific readers and software to analyze this plate. Floor spot then is a very similar assay, but multiplexed. This is just showing two, uh, uh, two color floor spot, but it can be up to four. So coating with two separate antibodies against two different cytokines against stimulating cells, which secrete two different cytokines, which are individually captured. And then we detect with secondary monoclonal antibodies. One is biotinylated. The other one is tagged with a short peptide against which we have developed a high affinity monoclonal antibody, which is then uh, conjugated to a fluorophore. And these two fluorophores are different colors. So then we can analyze this in a specific reader and we can look at cells secreting only one of the cytokines or both of the cytokines. So the software is very good at identifying exactly the spot center and really accurately measure which cells secrete two cytokines simultaneously. So you need a reader and software for this as well, of course, for analysis. And using four colors, then you generate quite a lot of data. Uh, floor spot also has another advantage. It generates a new dimension of data, which we call relative spot volume. So using the increased processing powers of graphic cards, the raw spot technology extracts a three-dimensional volume for each spot, shown here in the cartoon as small hills. And this volume corresponds to the relative amount of secreted cytokine. So how can we use this extra dimension of data? This is an interesting paper 
in cancer. <clears throat> so here they look at PD-1 inhibitors. PD-1 is a inhibit inhibitory receptor on CD8 T cells. And in cancer, it's quite common that infiltrating cytotoxic T cells in the tumor are turned off using this PD-1 co-receptor. So if you block this receptor, you kind of release the cytotoxic T cells and they can then again kill the cancer cells. So in this experiment, they looked at infiltrating T cells in ovarian cancer and looking down here, uh, whoops, on, on down here, it's a tumor infiltrating T cells. They don't have, these ones are not stimulated. These ones are stimulated with anti-CD3 and CD3 is expressed as a co-receptor on CD8 and CD4 T cells. So that activates all T cells in the well. Then if you add the PD-1 inhibitor, you see that the frequency of producing cells increases, but also the amount of interferon gamma they produce. So we, if we look up here on the graphs, we see that CD3 alone gives this response, this frequency, adding PD-1 inhibitor increases the frequency. But even more strikingly, anti-CD3 alone gives this amount of secreted interferon gamma. This is the sum of RSV in the whole well while adding a PD-1 inhibitor really increases the amount of secreted interferon gamma, which has interesting anti-tumor effects, indirect and direct. So that's one application of RSV. So how does T-cell stimulation work? So when you set up an L-spot assay, you need to stimulate T-cells, and the most common way is to use defined peptides which stimulate T cells. So how do these peptides stimulate T cells? Well, in a natural, let's say COVID infection, the viral proteins are degraded inside the cell into peptides of different lengths. These peptides can be presented on, on MHC class two to CD4 T cells or MHC class one to CD8 T cells. MHC class two is a gene cluster expressing different HLAs and the large groups are called DR, DQ, DP, and there's a lot of variants here. So it's a very variable protein family, which is good for the human population because it gives us, as a population, a good ability to, to survive most pathogens, even though some people will die, some will survive, because all of us, we express different HLA variants, and they will bind different peptides from the pathogen. So the peptide, so this HLA MHC class two is expressed on antigen presenting cells, such as dendritic cells, monocytes and B cells. And the peptides have certain anchor residues, which bind to pockets in the HLA. And those pockets are different for all the different versions of HLAs. And some residues bind to the T cell receptor. And for MHC class two, the peptides are really usually between 12 and 17 amino acids. While for MHC class one, the peptides are shorter. This is more of a closed structure, the MHC class one or the HLA ABC proteins. It has anchor residues on the NNC terminus and some, pep some amino acids interacting with the T cell receptor. This interaction then triggers the T cell to activate. On the right here, is an example of using defined CD4 epitopes, 15 amino acids in length. Uh, and these are from CMV. And then stimulating CD4 cells or CD8 cells with peptide one and two. So as you see, peptide one really stimulates only CD4 cells, while peptide two stimulates both CD4 cells and CD8 cells. So how can this happen? Well, the peptides, when you add them to cells, can be processed uh, through proteases and degraded into shorter peptides. And it's quite common, actually, that longer peptides, which bind to MHG class 2, also contain shorter stretches of amino acids, which bind to MHG class 1. So we have a CD4 and a CD8 epitope within the same uh, peptide. And in general, when you map responses to pathogens, you see that the T cell epitopes often cluster in certain parts of proteins. So they're not kind of homogeneously expressed on the whole protein. 
Yes, so this is just an example of how you would uh, design peptide pools for a pathogen. Here's showing SARS-CoV-2 as an example. So it's been shown that the spike protein, the nuclear protein, and the membrane protein are really immunodominant and induce strong T cell responses. If you don't, if you haven't mapped these epitopes, you have to start with scanning peptide pools. So that means that you take 15 amino acid. So you take a protein and then you design peptides, which are 15 amino acids in length, and they overlap by 11, and then they cover the whole in this case, <clears throat> S1 domain of the spike. This will give you access to most possible epitopes and HLA types. So it's a good method. If the epitopes have been defined, you can take the most dominant epitopes and mix them into a defined peptide pool, showing down here with the SNMO pool. Then we have defined dominant epitopes from S1, S2 of spike, also from and, and, and some ORF open reading frames. This is just to show you a typical setup of a LSPOT experiment. So you need a, um, you always need unstimulated wells with no stimuli added. That's to see the background. Here we have two blood donors, uh, healthy blood donors, and usually we use 250,000 peripheral blood mononuclear cells per well to look at low frequencies of antigen specific T cells. So then we need positive control. So this actually shows only positive controls. And those are divided in antigen specific positive controls based on peptide pools and polyclonal controls such as anti CD3 and PHA. So the peptide pools can be defined in such a way so that they only stimulate CD8 cells, like the KEF and KEF extended here. So they contain defined CD8 epitopes from two common human herpes viruses and flu, which many people are vaccinated against. And you can see if you add more epitopes in this individual, for example, you get a higher frequency of response, maybe because you access another HLA, or you have some extra epitope, which is not present in, in this smaller pool. You can also use CMV only, uh, because CMV is very prevalent in the population and gives strong T cell responses in most people. So this pool contains CD8 and CD4 epitopes from CMV. So this gives both CD4 and CD8 responses. And as you see, the CMV response is variable. This individual has a stronger response than this one. You can also use a CD4 specific positive control like this Kefta pool. So this is only CD4 epitopes, 35 peptides from CMV, EBV, flu, tetanus, which is also a vaccine, and Adeno-5, which is a common cold virus also used in some of the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. And another positive, then a, a polyclonal positive control is anti-CD3. That's quite common. It activates both CD8 and CD4 cells. And note that we use much less cells here. So if we add 250,000 cells in these wells, they will become totally black. PHA is a lectin binds glycan, glycans on the surface of the leukocytes, aggregating them and thereby giving activations. It's also a very common positive control. So that's a typical Ellispot experiment. CMV is also clinically interesting since in immunosuppressed patients, it can have really fatal consequences if the virus reactivates. So in this interesting paper, they used interferon gamma Ellispot to look at frequencies of CMV specific T cells in transplant patients. And they could see that patients, so the each dot is a patient and the red dots are patients with low CMV specific frequencies. And these patients progress to high CMV load. So the conclusion was that you can use CMV LSPOT to predict outcome of low level CMV reactivation in transplant recipients. On the left, just showing that it's an advantage to mix 
uh, dominant epitopes from several viral proteins. So this is a peptide pool based on one CMV protein, quite weak response. This is another CMV protein. This protein is actually usually giving a dominant response. But if you use epitopes from four different CMV proteins, you get a much higher frequency res of response. You can also design positive anti antigen specific positive control for non human primates. Macaque is a common model. And macaques also have CMV, most of the macaques in captivity, but it's macaque CMV, it's rhesus CMV or cinemogus CMV. So if you stimulate macaque cells with human CMV peptide pools, that will not give any response, but these, these viruses are quite different. But here we designed two different CMV pools based on macaque CMV. And we can see that pool number two here gave a really good response in these two different cinemogus macaques. And also in rhesus, although weaker in rhesus, whoops, pool one worked slightly better. A little bit more about T cells. So T cells secrete effector cytokines. And on the left, we have CD4 T cells. So all these are different uh, groups of CD4 T cells. CD4 T cells are called, also called helper T cells because they help cytotoxic CD8 T cells to mature and they help B cells to make antibodies. But depending on different pathogen exposure, they can differentiate in different types of T helper cells called TH1, TH2, and so on. And these are defined by the cytokines they secrete. And using four color fluorospot, you can basically address all these populations in the same well. Then cytotoxic T cells, they release specific uh, killer proteins such as perfin and granzyme B. Uh, these induce apoptosis in the target cell. So the purpose of these cells is to kill virus infected cells. So they are very important. They also produce interferon gamma. So CD4 helper T cells, as I said, different pathogens induce different subsets. In this experiment in mice, they infected with three different pathogens, which give TH1, TH2, TH17 response. So the, the dogma says that that these are really discrete populations of cells. So the interesting thing with this quite recent paper is that they use two methods. So in flow cytometry, they could really divide this into discrete populations, but using single cell RNA sequencing, uh, they were not really able to easily parse them into discrete T helper lineages. Instead, they form a continuum of polarized phenotypes shaped by the pathogen. And for example, the TH2 cells also express some interferon gamma, even though in theory that should only be expressed by TH1 cells. So using fluorospot, this is actually what we see. It's closer to single cell RNA sequencing than flow cytometry. So this triple fluorospot uh, stimulating with this CD4 specific peptide pool I mentioned before, we get interferon gamma, IL-4 and IL-5 responses. Interferon gamma is a TH1 cytokine. These two are TH2. But we, looking at all the populations, we can see a significant population with interferon gamma IL-4 producing cells, which according to the dogma should not exist. Uh, we don't see a population of IL-4 plus IL-5 producing cells. So that means that even though both IL-4 and IL-5 or TH2 cells, there may be subpopulations even within TH2 cells, which have quite different functions. So IL-4 and IL-5 have very different functions on other immune cells. So using flow cytometry, you can divide memory T cells as well in different uh, subtypes. So when, when a T cell is activating, it becomes an effector cell and starts doing different things to combat the pathogen. 
but then it differentiates into a memory cell which can still stay in the body for many years and these memory cells based on cell surface markers uh, CCR7 and CD45 RA for example can be divided into central memory and effector memory or termi terminally differentiated effector memory and the interesting thing about these different memory cells are that they secrete different cytokines or different amount of them. So for CD8s, for example, this is actually taken from Marcus' paper. Central memory cells produce lots of IL-2, but no granzyme. Effector memory cells produce less IL-2 and more granzyme and terminally differentiated effector memory. They produce no IL-2 and lots of granzyme and periphery. And this slide showed basically the same thing, but the memory T cells, the effector cells are CCR7 negative. CCR7 is a chemokine receptor, which has to do with migration to lymph nodes. So these effector cells, they migrate to inflamed tissues where they can perform their functions against the pathogens by releasing interferon gamma IL-5 and granzyme, for example. Why the central memory cells they express lots of IL-2, which is used for T-cell division and proliferation. And they have CCR7, so they can migrate to lymph nodes where they can stimulate dendritic cells. And they can also differentiate into these cells. So this is probably a floating continuum, which changes all the time. And, and this data just shows what the different subsets, which cytokines they produce, as I showed on the previous slide. The CD4 memory cells produce IL-2, uh, effector cells less IL-2, but lots of interferon gamma, while memory cells do not produce interferon gamma, for example. And here we show that the terminally differentiated effector cells, CD8 cells, produce lots of perfrin, while central memory does not. So finally, moving into SARS-CoV-2 data, so starting with T-cell memory responses induced by infection, and then I'll show responses induced by vaccination. So there is a growing body of evidence that points to a key role for SARS-CoV-2 specific T-cell responses in COVID-19 disease, both resolution and modulation of disease severity. Uh, so milder cases of acute COVID-19 have been associated with coordinated antibody CD4 and CD8 T cell responses, whereas severe cases correlate with a lack of coordination of cellular and antibody responses, and also a de delayed kinetic of the adaptive response. So this slide just shows some of that data published in Cell, showing that SARS-CoV-2 specific CD4 and CD8 T cells are associated with less COVID-19 disease severity. So on the left, we have CD4, uh, SARS-CoV-2 specific CD4s. And we can see that if you have a low frequency of response, there's more severe disease in red in those patients and a high response, much less severe disease and the same pattern for CD8 cells. So this is just to say that T cells are probably quite important in COVID. As you know, B cells and antibodies protect from infection, but once you pass that barrier and you're infected, then T cells are very important to control the disease and the disease severity. So of course, both arms are important, but B cells are probably not enough in antibodies. So now applying what we learned in the theory section to COVID, this shows how you map the COVID specific T cell response into and see which antigens are the most immunodominant and which epitopes you can find. So in this paper, they used a panel of over 400 overlapping peptides scanning the whole SARS-CoV-2 proteome. And you can see a frequency of responses in convalescent patients against uh, so who had mild or severe disease against spike, different open reading frames, M, N, and the total. And in flow cytometry then, as you see, I often 
<laughs> show both L spot, flow spot, and flow cytometry data. That's because they're very often used in combination. So they are really complementary, uh, very good orthogonal methods showing the same thing sometimes, which is a real strength. So if you show the same thing using orthogonal methods, that gives really more power to your data and conclusions. But here on the left, I just wanted to show that the CD4 response against COVID seems to be composed of T cells, memory T cells producing IL-2 alone, IL-2 and interferon gamma, and interferon gamma alone. So using only interferon gamma L spot, you will not capture the full response. That's why it's good to use four spot and look at interferon gamma and IL-2. While the CD8 response seems to be mostly only single interferon gamma producing cells at least in mild cases. So the conclusion from this paper was that the dominant um, immunodominant proteins were S, N, and, and M. And the data suggests that it could be good to include N and M in future vaccines. So to stimulate a stronger effector T cell response. Here on the right is flow cytometry data again, which very this is a very elegant way. If you map epitopes using floor spot, this is a very elegant orthogonal uh, way to show that this epitope is really relevant using pentamers. And pentamers are MHC peptide complexes, which specifically stain certain T cells, which specifically recognize only this peptide. So this is a CD8. T cell recognizing this peptide and the HLA is B4001. So this is just one subtype of HLA-B which this patient had. Looking more into depth in SARS-CoV-2 spike specific memory T cell responses, <clears throat> which is relevant since all the vaccines coming now, uh, which have been launched or are close to launch are against spike. So one thing we can see is that, is that the CD4 T cell response is more prominent than CD8 T cell response. And on the left, starting on the left, we can see that CD8 and CD4s make interferon gamma, while only CD4s make IL-2. Both make TNF-alpha, not much IL-17. Only CD8 make CD107A. This is a pseudo marker used in flow cytometry, since, since you cannot look at grand and perfine directly, you use this marker for degranulation to indicate that the cells have uh, released their cytotoxic granules. Looking at the memory subtypes, CD4 T cells seem to be mostly central memory and effector memory, while the CD8 T cells are terminally differentiated. Also, Kinetics, we can see that after six months, the CD4 T cell seems to be dominant and CD8s diminish. It could be also that the CD8s migrate into tissues. So this is only, most data I present or all of it is uh, only on, in the periphery in blood because the tissues are hard to access. But Marcus will probably talk more about tissues. He is an expert in tissue lymphocytes. Then looking with interferon gamma L2 floor spot at the same thing. So here we have four convalescent COVID individuals, and we can see the fractions of cells producing only interferon gamma, only IL-2, or both of them. So based on the data we saw before, the IL-2 only should be central memory CD4s and IL-2 interferon gamma effector memory CD4s, and interferon gamma alone can be both CD4 and CD8. And these look quite different in different individuals. This individual, for example, has a lot of signal producing cells. And down here, if we look with the RSV, so this is a log scale. And in this case, we show RSV not as a sum, but rather each, uh, this is RSV for all spots in one well. So we see the full population and how much they produce. And 
this individual produces much more interferon gamma per cell than the other ones. Also, it has much more single producing interferon gamma. So that's quite interesting. I'm not sure exactly what it means. It has to be studied further. And here, gamma L2 fluor spot again. On the left here, looking at dual producing cells, so which produce both IL-2 and interferon gamma. And the kinetics, so each dot here is a convalescent patient. And the kinetics show that the memory T cells actually increase over time for both these peptide pools used, both for spike and for the defined peptide pool uh, covering many different proteins. And looking at disease severity, there's a trend at least that in severe critical patients, there are lower frequencies of memory T cells than compared to mild, which is correlating to all the other published data that T cells are important to control disease. Now jumping into tuberculosis for a while, just to show you that the relevance of measuring several cytokines. So in tuberculosis, uh, interferon gamma L spot has been used for a long time for in vitro diagnostics to distinguish vaccinated individuals from infected individuals. But using single interferon gamma, you cannot, for example, distinguish untreated from treated patients or, you, or distinguish active TB infection from latent tuberculosis. But in this interesting paper, they look at these populations and they can see that when you treat patients, <clears throat> the gamma L2 population, the frequency of those cells really increase and it's a very significant increase. So here that double producing population is interesting. While active TB compared to latent TB, there you can look at the interferon gamma only response to a certain peptide pool. And that is significantly, significantly different between active and latent tuberculosis. But you cannot look at interferon gamma only using interferon gamma L spot because then you would capture both this population and this because both these make interferon gamma. But here you can distinguish them because that makes interferon gamma plus IL-2 while that makes interferon gamma alone. Then coming into cytotoxic T cells, which are harder to address using flow cytometry, you can use interferon gamma granzyme B for a spot. So on the left, we have two individuals uh, unstimulated, stimulated with the SNMO plus S1 pool. They have nice interferon gamma granzyme responses and the controls do not have antigen specific responses. And this is a positive control. And looking at the graphs here, there's also quite big differences between individual. So individuals, uh, individual number one, for example, has a lot of cells making interferon gamma, but not many cells making granzyme. Uh, and of course the cells making granzyme in red and green are cytotoxic T cells. And those are very important for killing virus infected cells, as I said. So those are quite interesting to also take into account. So what about T cell responses induced by vaccination? So the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, as you know, has been very successful. They made two versions. The first one was based, so it's an RNA vaccine formulated in nanoparticles. The first one was based only on the receptor binding domain, which is a small domain of spike. And looking up here, we, we see the CD4 T cell response. So by depleting CD8s, CD8s from PBMCs, you can look only at CD4s. And the RBD response pre-vaccination and post. So you see a very nice response. KEF is used as a positive control for CD8s. It should not be positive. KEF is used as an antigen specific control for CD4s and it's positive, but not as strongly as the vaccine as of course. And then a negative control. Same for CD8s, nice RBD response, nice KEF response. They also did dose titration and came to the conclusion that 30 micrograms was an optimal dose. 
But then they actually compared two different versions. The second version here is called V2. And this is based on the full spike trimer RNA. And this is actually the one which went through to phase three and, and now is given to people all over the world. So why did they choose uh, this version? Well, basically because it gives a much broader T cell response. That was one of the most compelling reasons because they both give quite good antibody responses and neutralizing responses since RBD is the target for neutralizing antibodies. But of course the full spike contains much more T, -cells, T cell epitopes than the RBD alone. So looking at the LSPOT data again, we have, uh, we see a CD4 response to RBD to the S1 domain of spike, S2 domain of spike and the controls. Interestingly, the CD8 response to RBD is very weak, while we have a good response to S1 and S2 domain. And RBD is actually part of the S1 domain here. So why is this? It's probably because there are more potent and dominant T cell epitopes outside of RBD region, uh, the RBD region, which kind of dominate this response and the response to the RBD epitopes are then weakened. And looking down here again, we can see that the vaccine induces uh, CD4 T cells, which produce IL-2 alone, both IL-2 and intron gamma and intron gamma alone. And the CD8 cells mostly produce only intron gamma. The memory response then is mostly central uh, effector memory, uh, the CD8 memory response. While as maybe you remember my slide on the natural infection, it was more skewed towards uh, the Temra cells, the terminally differentiated effector memory. So the next step in this study would be to map the responses induced by the vaccine and compare to the natural ones. And since that hasn't been done yet, I will show a slide on CD4 epitope identification by Frostbot using the Shingrix vaccine. The Shingrix vaccine is quite interesting is against varicella zoster, which gives chickenpox and late in life can give shingles. But the natural exposure to, to varicella zoster does not protect from shingles, while this vaccine does. So this paper is quite nice. You should read it. They compare natural infection and uh, the response after shingrix vaccination and show that they actually give quite different uh, profiles of T cell responses. So the Shingrix really concentrate the T cell response to this GE protein. It's a surface glycoprotein on this virus. And that response is not quite prominent, uh, very prominent in the natural infection. So this vaccine is formulated with an adjuvant, which gives a mixed Th1, Th2 response. So in order, order to, to measure the full response, so all the responding T cells, they used the sum of intron gamma TNF IL-5, so a triple fluorospot, to map these responses. And as we went through in theory, you start with a uh, what they call a mega pool with 123 overlapping peptides over this protein and test vaccinees. And so you have a positive response with the mega pool. You then break it down into mesopools uh, containing only 10 epitopes. And they are shown here. And this individual responds nicely to mesopool 8, which can be <coughs> deconvoluted into the individual 10 peptides. And finally, you can show that this individual responds to this specific CD4 peptide. And using this method, they could map 89 epitopes uh, induced, CD4 T cell epitopes induced by this vaccine. Yeah, so that was the final slide actually. So we will uh, move into the question, questions and discussion panel. And I'm really looking forward to talking to Marcus. Thank you for the attention. Well, thank you so much Bartek for that fantastic presentation. Um, like you said, well, we will move on to the Q&A portion of the webinar, but first I'd like to introduce our panel. 
Joining us is Christian Smedman. Christian was the lead architect behind Iris and is our floor spot expert here at MapTech. And for those who joined halfway through, we also have a special guest, Marcus Bugert, who is an associate professor at the Swedish Carolina Inska Institute and has published several high impact papers on T cells in the context of COVID-19. Now to start out, I'd like to direct uh, the first question towards Marcus. Uh, Marcus, which assay do you prefer, Ellie Spot or AIM? Or does your experimental setup guide this, this guide this decision? Uh, yeah, no, it's a it's a great question. Thank thank you first to for inviting me for this Q and A session. Uh, no, but I totally agree with what you're saying. It, it totally depends on the type of question that we're usually after. I think just like Bartik was saying initially, that Ellisbot is a fantastic tool to really go after if you have a, a question. Uh, where, you, where you know that you're most likely going to have a TH1 type of response. So in other words, an interferon gamma producing T cell response against a virus, for example, you want to screen it through, see if you have it. I think it's great. And then usually we, we're using it as a first screening approach. But if you want to usually go in and you want to phenotype the cells more, you want to understand more in detail if it's CD4 responses, CD8 responses, what kind of memory phenotype do they have, just like Barkis was saying. Then we usually try to go in and we use, uh, for example, AIM assays or uh, or uh, flow cytometry uh, assays in that sense as well. So it depends a little bit on the questions that we usually have. No, absolutely. Absolutely. I appreciate that. And then again, I just wanted to remind you that uh, if you'd like to ask a question at all during this webinar, uh, just uh, click on the Q&A box down at the bottom and uh, feel free to ask your question. But thank you, Marcus. I appreciate that answer. Then uh, your co-hosts here, Jens and Lara, we could um, ask a question directly to uh, Christian Smedman, I think, our fluorospot expert. We have a question from Masita Arip. Um, the results from fluorospot, are they quantitative or semi-quantitative? What is the unit for fluorospot and alispot? Um, yes, so in both Fluorospot and Elispot, we uh, we deal with spot forming units like it has been for uh, for uh, since the assay was uh, was created and spot forming units is uh, yeah you count the number of spots but Iris has introduced this new thing called RSV, which stands for relative spot volume as Bartek talked about, and this is semi quantitative. Uh, the thing is. Uh, the, the calculations uh, based on the volume of the spots is based on real mathematics that has been published in high impact peer reviewed mathematical journals. So that is based on sound mathematics, but we don't have a control. We cannot create an artificial cell secreting a known quantity of cytokine. If we had that, we could uh, add that into the flora spot assay and then uh, uh, detect like, aha, uh, here's a cell secreting one picogram of interferon gamma and it generates this kind of RSV value. We don't have that. So we call it semi-quantitative. And uh, what you can do is that you can essentially compare RSV values for interferon gamma in one filter uh, with RSV values uh, in the same filter in another well. So if the RSV values trip is three times higher, you can be certain that the cell secreted three times more cytokine. Uh, but we cannot, uh, we call it semi-quantity. Yeah, thank you, Christian. So we go over to the next question from our audience. And I think this question is first for Bartek, but I think I would also to like to hear Marcus perspective on this. And the question is, can you recommend specific companies for ordering peptides, which were shown to work fine with your assays? So I think, I think you get the biased answer from Bartek here, but I would also like to know uh, Marco's opinion on this. What is his experience? Go on, Bartek. You can start. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> as you know, Mab produces a lot of peptide pools, which we have validated. But of course, there's many other companies. I don't know if Marcus prefers other companies. I think that what we have been trying to do lately is to uh, uh, we order all the overlapping peptide pools basically from uh, uh, companies. <laughs> 
and then uh, we make our own pools now these days. In the, originally, at least, we were using the uh, pools from uh, Milton A, but I don't think that they provide exactly which peptides are included in those pools, actually, on their homepage, uh, uh, someone told me. So if you really want to know exactly what you're putting into your assay, then, of course, the recommendation is to buy your own overlapping peptide pools. It can be very expensive, and that's the reason why you can go to a company like maybe Milton A or uh, GPT or Mobtech, for example, as well. Yes. Yeah, I can comment uh, that we our peptide pools, we always publish uh, all the peptides in the pool, and we have defined pools and scanning pools. But of course, as Marcus says, if you have a question, specific question regarding a specific proteins, it's not we cannot cover all different questions with our peptide pools. So then you have to make your own if you want to do something that's not available mm. through a company. Then you can contact a peptide synthesis company and, or another company that can make kind of designed pools for you uh, containing exactly the peptides you want. Thank you. Um, here's a question, I think mainly for Marcus, as you are, um, is an expert, you are an expert of uh, leukocytes in the tissues. So the question is, do CD4 positive T cell responses to the virus predominate over CD8 positive T cell responses in the lung and the blood? Yes, great question. Uh, the, the full answer is that we still don't know that. There are some studies out there implying that the CD4 responses are higher also in general in both in, in the lung, in, in, uh, in the blood. But one thing one needs to remember, at least when it comes to lung, is there's a highly vascularized uh, organ. So you, you will have a lot of recirculation of CD4 positive T cells going on in that region as well. But if you start to look into an upper respiratory tract, uh, for example, in a tonsil or something else there, then you will start to see that uh, you, you can detect more, for example, CD8 responses that you don't uh, detect, for example, in the blood. And the reason for that is because the CD8 positive T cells there have a resident memory status. So they, are sent, they, they create the sentinel response basically in the upper respiratory tract. And that is important for them so that at the next time point when you get uh, infected again, that they can launch this rapid immune re response. Because normally, even if you have antibodies, most people think that, that they're sterilizing you, but it's actually not really true. They are gonna protect you and they will protect most of the virus maybe from coming in, but you actually need your T cells as well to kind of shut down that small fire as well. And this has been shown for multiple other viruses and it has been shown also for SARS-CoV-2 in monkeys, that that's the case here as well. And it's like Bartik was saying, there's no question antibodies are key for a good vaccine and it's, a, I think, still probably the best correlate that we do have, but it's going to all come down to if you actually have both in the end and if you have a good enough levels of them actually at the sites where it actually matters, which is going to be your upper respiratory tract. So that was a long answer, but it kind of covers it, uh, everything, and I can probably talk for this for hours <laughs> uh, about it as well, but I won't. So, yeah. We'll, we'll move on, probably. <laughs> uh, I can also comment that the COVID vaccines now, uh, which are being distributed, they're not designed to give sterilizing immunity. So you will get infected, but you will probably get mild or no disease. And that's probably due both to, due to antibodies, which kind of decrease the viral load that you're exposed to. And then of course, T cells, which then kill off the small fires, which, which will bloom mm -hmm. up anyway. I think it's a good uh, it's a good point that you're raising, and that's the reason why many people, for example, are interested to to induce better mucosal vaccine type of responses that are going to induce higher levels of antibodies, for example, in your saliva and in the upper respiratory tract to a high degree. But it's a good point. I think it's it it's so tricky this thing because everyone is saying, but it's actually true for natural immunity as well because most people say that we don't become reinfected, but if you get exposed, you will actually per se become reinfected, but it's just that your memory response is so quick to turn off that virus. So you won't be able to detect it or you won't be able to actually even develop any symptoms. And that is actually immunity. It's very few vaccines that are actually truly inducing any type of sterilized immunity. 
maybe there are some you can start to think about, but it's it's even there. The cell usually becomes infected actually in, in the end. But it's a good point that you're raising that you know these vaccines are protecting you mostly from the um, from the disease and they are not fully sterilizing, which is important to mention as well. Yes. Now, thank you for that, Marcus. Um, now I've got a question uh, for Bartek. In the assay showing granzyme B activity, at what moment and time point during disease was this assay done? Uh, this is done on uh, PVMCs from patients which are convalescent from from uh, COVID-19 disease uh, about three to four months after disease. Perfect. So they had fairly mild disease, these patients. Gotcha, thank you. Yeah, and here comes the next question. So severe COVID-19, could that be linked to an impaired development of SARS-CoV-2 specific memory T cells? I think this is a more question that could be discussed among the panel, right? Yeah, I mean, go on, I, yeah, just short comment from my knowledge of the literature, it seems that severe and mild COVID is, is correlated to a kind of a coordinate. So if you get mild disease, you have coordinated uh, cellular immune responses, coordinating B cells, CD4 cells, and CD8 cells. So you need to involve all the arms of the immune system, so to say. So if, if, you, if you have kind of a delayed cellular immune response, you seem to get more severe COVID, or if you have low frequencies of T cells. What do you say, Marcus? Yeah, no, I, I agree. And it's, it's a little bit also about the kinetics. So many people, for example, might, may be able to develop uh, memory T cell responses if you have more severe disease. But what, what we think and what other people think in the field is that, for, for example, elderly people and people that, uh, that get severe disease, what is happening there is that their innate immune system potentially is not kicked in rapidly enough. And that means that you're not inducing your memory T cell and B cell response as well. So you don't produce a lot of antibodies and T cells uh, uh, you know, early enough, just like Bartik is saying with the coordinated response. So it's actually the same thing that we've talked about in the HIV field for a long time. It's, it's about this fact that it's a little bit too little and too uh, late, basically, in severe disease. So that's the key to induce you know, an early... Uh, adaptive immune response. And that can, is potentially probably going to be important before you actually get this hyperinflammation that takes on in, in the lungs in severe disease. Yes. Yeah, because upper respiratory tract infections such as SARS-CoV-2 are usually quite fast. So the immune response has to kick in before the virus has kind of progressed too far. Mm. So it has to kick in within a few days, basically. Yes. So we have uh, another question here from a certain Staffan, and I think the question is directed towards you, Marcus. Um, does antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity play a role in COVID? I guess it is, <laughs> <laughs> but I have to be honest; I'm not an expert at it, at the at, at the topic. Uh, but but uh, sure, I think that there has been some people which has been concerned, at least originally, about the fact that it could be some antibody dependent enhancement of the disease uh, as well. That antibodies can actually be a poor, a bad thing, and maybe same thing there. Maybe it will at a later stage of the infection. And maybe ADCC can play a role there as well in a bad way. But if you kick it in early enough, I don't see a reason for why it should not be something good for your immune response as well. But uh, to be honest, uh, I'm, I'm, I haven't read myself into the literature enough to, to sit there and say if it's good or bad. But uh, I think it's about the timing as the rest of the immune system. Thank you. Uh, I've got a, our next question. Uh, results from the Swedish community study studying T cell responses and PBMC from convalescent COVID patients were presented yesterday. And the author, authors claim that only a small portion of those that didn't have detectable antibodies had T cell memory. No uh, antibodies, no T cell memory. 
Do you know what method they use to assess T cell responses and do you agree with their conclusion? As a matter of fact, I talked to these people for one hour ago. So, um, so I know exactly how their results looks like. I can't say, I can't say exactly how the results looks like, but let, <laughs> let's put it like this, that the, the communication that was sent out the media uh, is not really how the results looks like. And it actually looks more similar to what we showed before one than what they're showing. But uh, what they have been doing is that they have uh, essentially designed a peptide pool with, with very few peptides. And they have used then uh, a screening method from whole blood, where they are basically taking whole blood to screen them with uh, a unique set of uh, peptides. I think it's only 16 peptides that they think are SARS-CoV-2 specific. And then they measure interferon gamma and IL-2 release. And when they do that, they see that you have uh, uh, response is still, it's actually a pretty good assay. I have to, I have to give them that. It's, it's, it looks good. So I've seen some of the data and they, they have good sensitivity of the assay. So, it, so it's a little bit similar, I, I guess, to, you know, Ellis, but in a different fashion because they, they want to screen through a lot of patients. And I, I, without saying too much about the results, what they see is that if you use this limited pool of peptides, then they detect responses. Uh, for two thirds of the people uh, nine months afterwards. But if they, uh, the, if they use the entire spike region, they basically see it for all patients still at nine, at nine uh, months. And they never presented that data. And without spoiling it, there is many people that are responding also towards the full spike uh, region, uh, which are zero negative as well. Uh, but what they try to say, and this has to do with this issue about cross reactivity, that what they're trying to do is to develop an assay, which is going to be more SARS-CoV-2 induced or SARS-CoV-2 specific, basically with this peptide pools. And uh, th that's, uh, that, that's the results that they were presenting from the community uh, study uh, yesterday. And, um, but if, but, it, but it's, there's no question about that. There are multiple people that we don't know if they're being exposed. We don't know if it's, it's cross-reactive responses, but uh, there's plenty of these people in their study that are showing SARS-CoV-2 specific TC responses, but, but uh, they don't know if it's due to the virus or a cross-reactive coronavirus response. But did they use also pre-COVID samples as controls? No, they haven't. No, so of course the, the disease is widely spread and many people had no symptoms or mild disease. So, so it might well be that they have real responses, but. Maybe. And these are people which has been a highly exposed environment as well. So, and they, yeah. they, they agree about that. So they, they, they say that. Um, when you and of course, them. the less peptides you use, the less different HLA types you target and so on. So you will get the lower response rate, probably frequency. Yeah. Yes, uh, no, no question about it. But they are, I think their assay is looking pretty good because they're using a similar assay, I think, to what people have been using in the TB field uh, as well for like a whole blood. Like interferon gamma assays, release basically. assay or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But my there understanding were, was, was that they also used uh, interferon gamma L2 fluor spot in that study, but maybe they haven't. Yeah. They have, they have been using it and they, they see it's similar to what you were saying as well, that it's more interferon gamma than IL-2 uh, yeah. in contrast actually to what we do in flow cytometry, but I think it's due to that gamma is getting released faster and we, we, we don't catch it enough in our flow cytometry assays, unfortunately. But, they, uh, but, but it's ex more or less exactly what, yeah, you are showing and I guess what other people are showing as well. I think that they have been trying to detecting their blood, uh, whole blood assay, also other cytokines like TNF and IL-5, et cetera. But it's really gamma and IL-2 that is uh, coming out as being uh, positive in their assays. Yeah. Yes. Because I, I spoke to scientists at the Swedish CDC today who are doing similar studies with interferon gamma IL-2 for a spot. And their data did not really show the same thing. Uh, that is not interferon gamma and IL-2. No, no, they, they didn't show that people who, they didn't have a high frequency of people without T cell responses. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. But that's the but point. But they use that, overlapping yeah. peptide pools covering nucleop, 
you know n m n s and so on so they have yeah so i think that uh, yeah so the interpretation of all this data is difficult because people are using different peptide pools and different methods. So. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it is. And I, I was also a little bit surprised about the, the data and, and I, I was. I should have used you as a consultant. <laughs> well, I can tell you that I had reporters calling me up all day yesterday trying to ask me if they were wrong or not, but I, I. I, 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 but I know what they want usually. They want to pick up a fight between, you know, two different groups. And I said, yeah. no, but I said that, look, uh, I, um, I, I said, they're doing great science. I, I think that they're doing it correctly. I'm, I don't have anything against it. And uh, then they, and then they called me up today and explained for me why they see the results they're seeing. And, and uh, that, that, that is the reason that they are, they have extremely few peptides that they're looking at when they call it SARS-CoV-2 specific because they really don't want to have any cross-reactive responses. But is that going to be fully representative of the entire SARS-CoV-2 specific response? No, it won't. And they agree about it. Um, but actually, but if, to, if you want to know if a, a response is cross-reactive, you should test, let's say, 100 convalescents and 100 pre-COVID PBMCs with one peptide. Yeah. And then you have defined that peptide. And I don't think they have done that for all these 16 peptides. And they can't, of course, because it's whole blood they're looking into. Yeah, yeah. So uh, now they, they can't. So, so so it's hard to claim that they are specific then. <laughs> I yes. Um, don't I, I, call the report immediately. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think it's actually published. That that was actually the good reason for me to say that I I can't answer your questions to reporters and others because there's no study out there. So I can't I can't judge it even. No, it but, hasn't been published. No, and there's no preprint as well. So I but I but I know talking to them, they are great people. I you know I love interacting with them. They're and I'm we we, we are you know partly working together and we exchanging protocols and they're. They're good scientists. There's no question about it. And actually, and again, I, I think their method is good. I'm, I'm actually surprised they get it working so well. But they can't, a uh, little bit like you were talking about in the beginning, they can't just use it with a normal ELISA or anything like that. They, I think they have, they have, they need to have something a little bit more sensitive for the readout of uh, gamma towards the end. I don't know exactly what it is, but it's, uh, but it's something different. And that in that way, they can detect uh, hundreds of uh, samples in a quite short time point. But it's not a robot. You, you can't do it like you know with serology, so it will still take longer time. I don't know what that question was in the beginning. <laughs> it was something else. Maybe I was gonna. <laughs> I think the question was it. if their data was correct or not. But it's uh, no. It was a, the method. Maybe the, the method is a whole blood um, assay method, interferon gamma release assay. Basically, that's what. So they measure total interferon gamma. They don't look at frequencies of cells releasing interferon gamma. No. So um, we are uh, running out of time, but we have five questions still unanswered, and it would be such a shame not to answer them. And I know that our floor spot expert, Christian, needs to go very soon. So if we could at least, could we begin with that one and see if you, if you uh, can have the energy to stay for the last four questions as well, if we try to answer them quickly. So here's the question to you, Christian. Mm -hmm. Co-expression of cytokines using fluorospot assumes limited mobility of the cells in a 96 well plate. Is that understanding correct? This is a question for, from Hussein. Is Hussein's uh, understanding correct? What is the spatial resolution in assigning specific cytokines to a specific cell? Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, I mean, the method is based upon the cells uh, being rather still. And uh, the situation is that uh, this is not always the case. When you stimulate cells, they can move quite a lot. But there are some factors uh, that I would like to point out. And that is, uh, these assays are done in PVDF membranes plates. And the PVDF membrane looks a bit like a moon landscape when you look at it in a microscope. Uh, the cells, I do believe that the cells are like almost uh, yeah, they, they sort of merge almost with the membrane a little bit. It's not plastic where they can move tremendously. And we do see cells moving in fluorospot membranes. You can see that in the results. But what often happens is that the cell moves and leaves a trail, but the dominant amount of cytokine produced is actually after it has situated itself. 
And there you can see that it also produces another cytokine. Uh, but it's but but Hussein is fundamentally correct uh, in pointing out that if you have uh, the situation that uh, a cell secretes interferon gamma, turns off the interferon gamma secretion, moves for three hours, uh, crawls along the membrane, then produces IL-2, we would probably miss that. That would become two single producing cells. Uh, but that event is very um, uh, unlikely uh, to happen in, in, uh, in abundance, at least. But like with all methods, there are, uh, there are limitations. And uh, the resolution of the camera is 2048 times 2048. And when we developed the iris, we had help from KTH, Royal Institute of Technology, that did a tremendous uh, work. And they actually did simulations and calculated that we needed 1,200 times 1,200 to do uh, mathematically correct and sound determinations of cell centers. Uh, and uh, we have 2048 times 2048. So we have more than 1,200 pixels. And each pixel is uh, 3.4. 46 microns. So a very large T cell uh, is around three to five, three to six pixels on, uh, on the camera sensor. Yes, uh, thanks a lot going into the details here. And I think we, to make this speed up this a bit, we move on to the next question. And that one is, what do you think of the role of T cells in the case of vaccine that don't produce antibodies to the new variants? Uh, I mean, there was a paper recently showing that the new variants, uh, they can affect the T cell response. Also, that's been seen, I think, with some vaccine studies in South Africa, giving diminishing protection. But the, uh, no, the B cell response and the antibody response. But, but the T cell response was not affected because the mutations in RBD, there's really so many T cell epitopes in the whole spike. So they don't kind of affect the, the total T cell response in a negative way. So I think I the T cell response will not be affected by mutations, but the antibody response can be. Mm -hmm. And I, I basically agree about that. But it actually poses an important question, you know, for the future also when you design vaccines that uh, one potentially could think about, you know, including more antigens that are inducing T cells. And one of the reasons for it as well is not only about variants, but it's actually quite a lot of people out there, which is uh, on these B cell depleting drugs these days, everything from MS patients to, to different type of, uh, uh, of rheumatic uh, treatments as well. So, uh, and they are not going to really induce any good, you know, that well. They will induce some, some antibody responses because you usually don't deplete all the B cells. But for that reason, it could be of importance to, to potentially have a, uh, have a good uh, T cell maybe response as well. Yes. Okay, second to last question comes here from an anonymous attendee. Uh, would you be able to say that SARS-CoV-2 impairs memory T cells from forming or that it somehow hinders the function of T cells? It's an interesting question. Yeah, an interesting was about that, I think. <laughs> it's an interesting question. I think particularly this is something which I've been I've been thinking about quite a bit actually when it comes to the C8 response, particularly because it's it is a virus, it's an intracellular target, and it should induce a good C8 response. And even if we detect them sometimes in tissues and not in the blood, it's still a quite bad C8 response, I have to say. So maybe. Maybe it has some type of impact like CMV, HIV, and some other uh, viruses as well to impede, for example, MSC class one presentation, but we don't know is the, is the answer well, to But it. there is an interesting paper out there showing uh, quite dramatic effect on, effects on germinal centers. Mm. So kind of the affinity maturation is affected. So, so there are some strange effects on germinal centers where B cells are actually trained and affinity matured so that that can affect the kind of memory B cells and so on. But I don't know if that's been repeated in so many publications. It's an original cell paper. I think they've yeah. done some work on that in rhesus macaques as well, uh, where they feel that they see, okay, 
urinal center responses as well, what, what the K means, but it's not going to be as good as the vaccines. That's, that's for sure, at least. Mm. They're much better. They generate beautiful urinal center responses. Yeah, and of course, the advantage of the vaccine is that you get rid of all viral proteins, which could affect T and B cell yeah, yeah, responses. Yeah. So mm. it's, uh, the vaccine in theory could, could, could give much better responses than the natural infection. Mm. No, but it's true. Absolutely true. Yeah, I agree. All right, and now our last question. Could memory T cells infusion be helpful in COVID-19 treatment? Well, maybe. If you, if you let them go, if you design them to go to the right uh, site, which is really tricky, and we know that from CAR T cell therapies, maybe not particularly CAR T cell, but transgenic T cell therapies in solid tumors, for example, because you need to design those T cells to actually home in to the right right sides. I, I, even if I love my T cells, I would actually say here that I would rather go with monoclonal antibodies actually for these, for that type of therapy at this point. Yes. Well, awesome. Well, again, I want to thank you, Marcus, for joining us. Uh, thank you, Bartek, for your wonderful presentation. Thank you, Christian, for joining us as well. That'll do it for this webinar. Um, we will post a link to our social media and post it to our YouTube channel, this entire webinar, so you can check that out then. But uh, thank you again for joining us, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. And thanks, Marcus. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Mikia. Thank you. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Take care, everyone. Bye. Uh...